These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. Okay, well one thing that's gonna be important on the test is um, using arrows to draw reaction mechanisms. Not only will this be important on the test, this is crucial for the entire rest of the course. The entire rest of the course, after this midterm, the instructor is going to assume that you are a master of using curved arrows. Unfortunately, most students are not close to being masters. So it's very important that we get very comfortable with this because it'll be on the exam and it's, going to be, and it's going to be still crucial after the exam as well. The key thing that students don't understand, so these are what are called electron pushing arrows or curved arrows. The key thing that they don't, students don't understand is that once you're given the electron pushing arrows, there is no guesswork as to what the product is going to be. If we just follow what these arrows tell us to do, um, they will tell us exactly what the product is supposed to look like. Um, the key thing is we just have to take our time. Well, here's how you take your time. There's three things you should ask about these arrows. What bonds should I form? What bonds should I break? And which two charges should I change? And if you simply ask yourself those precise questions, you always get the right product. Which bonds do I form? Which bonds do I break? And which charges should I change? And we'll go through that together. Which bonds should we form? Which bonds should we break? And which charges should we change? Okay. By the way, there's two different types of mechanisms. There's radical mechanisms and non-radical mechanisms. In a radical mechanism, um, you're kind of moving one electron at a time, whereas in non-radical mechanisms, the arrows represent electron pairs. If this was a radical mechanism, we would draw single-headed arrows. These are maybe called single fish hook, fish hook arrows. So this would be for the radical mechanism. Well, notice that I drew arrows with two fish hooks, double-headed arrows. So, um, this is a non-radical mechanism. Each arrow here represents the movement of an electron pair. Um, in this course, you are going to see some radical mechanisms on your first midterm, but in the course, non-radical mechanisms are way more important than radical. Almost everything will be a non-radical mechanism, so we can start with this. Okay, well, let's look at this arrow. Uh, we have to ask, does this tell us to form a bond, to break a bond, or both? And let's ignore this arrow for the time being. Well, just based on your common sense, does this look like it is telling us to form a bond or break a bond? Form a bond. Between which two atoms? Um, carbon and iodine. That's right. Okay. So I'm just going to follow those, uh, follow those orders and put in a bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. Now, what else should the carbon be attached to? Well, it's attached to these three hydrogens. Here's something very important. We should only do things that the arrows tell us to do. We shouldn't break any bonds unless the arrows tell us to break a bond. So we know that we're not going to break these hydrogens off of the carbon because there's no arrows telling us to break that. That's one of the most common mistakes students make. Oftentimes, students break bonds for no reason. We're only going to break these bonds if there's an arrow that tells us to break it. And there is no arrow telling us to break it. So the hydrogens are still around. Now, do you think this is telling us to form a bond, break a bond, or both? Break a bond. Yeah. Between which two atoms? Um, carbon and bromine. Carbon and bromine. That's right. So I'll just write the bromine off to the side. All right. Now we've formed all the bonds we had to form, and we've broken all the bonds we have to break. Remember, the third thing we have to do is change the charges. You always change exactly two charges from any step of a mechanism. You always change exactly two charges. So you have to specifically ask yourself which two charges you're going to change. You always change the charge at the initial tail and the final head. You always change the charge at the initial tail and the final head. So we'll see what that means.
Um, would you call this the head or the tail of an arrow? Tail. How about this? Head. How about this? Tail. And this? Head. Excellent. For some reason, a lot of students get confused about what the head or the tail is, but uh, I use those terms a lot, so it's good that you know what I mean by that. Now, who's the initial tail? Do you see why I would call this the initial tail and not this? This is kind of in the middle of the string of arrows. So this is what I meant by the initial tail. So this is one of the places we're going to change a charge. And remember, there's no guesswork here. The arrows tell us exactly what to do. Well, this started with a negative charge. And is it gaining or losing electrons? Losing. So should it become more negative or more positive? More positive. Yeah. And we're always going to change by just one step. So how would we come, what would be the new charge if this is becoming one step less negative? That's right. So we don't even have to write anything down. But in our head, we should be noticing that this is changing from negative to neutral. Again, the key thing to notice is there's no guesswork about this. Um, this is starting negative, and it's losing electrons. So it must become one step less negative. All right, and then we also change the charge at the final head. Well, this is not the final head, because it's in the middle of the string of arrows. This is the final head. Well, what do you think the charge on the bromine is going to be? Negative. Yeah, how would you figure that out step by step? Um, that's right. It's getting a pair of electrons. So it becomes one step more negative. So it doesn't go to negative two, but just negative one. We're only ever going to change an atom by one step at a time. OK. Notice that you have to ask what we started at. If the bromine had started positive, it would have ended up neutral. It's only because it started neutral that it's ending up negative. And now we're done. And we know for sure that this is what the products look like. One thing to emphasize, a lot of students think of the charges as an afterthought. If they get the charges right, they think that they, they've done something extra special. Um, but the charges are the key to the whole course. The most important part of the picture is the charges. The whole point of what you're trying to do in this course is you're going to try to learn to predict how atoms will react. But who are the atoms that are going to react? It's the unhappy atoms that are going to react. And what makes something unhappy is having a charge. So knowing where the charges are is actually the most important part of the whole picture. Um, and unfortunately, most students, like I say, think of that as an afterthought. But TAs will definitely take off lots of points if you get the charges wrong. OK, so we have to change these two charges over here. Now, a lot of people might not even think, realize they changed this charge because they don't have to draw something in. But we did change this charge because it started negative. This one is more obvious that we're changing the charge because we have to draw something in. It's good to check. What was the net charge of all the starting materials? Well, this had a charge of negative 1, and this had a charge of 0. So the net charge was negative 1. And what was the net charge of all of our products? Well, this had a charge of 0, and this had a charge of negative 1. So its net charge was negative 1. There should always be balancing of charge. So on this first exam, you should always check yourself by making sure that the charge of the starting materials balances the charge of the products. Any individual starting material can have its charge change, but the net charge of all the starting materials has to balance the net charge of all the products. By the way, what we're talking about here is a, is a step in a reaction mechanism. But a lot of these principles also apply to resonance structures as well. Because when you're drawing any resonance structure, you also use curved electron pushing arrows that work a lot like these. So the same principles apply. Every arrow, to, um, you ask, which bond should I form, which bond should I break, and which two charges should I change? So pretty much everything we've said so far also applies to resonance, which will also probably be an important topic on the test. Again, many students get the charges wrong in resonance, but they shouldn't. They should just change two charges at the initial tail and the final head, and then they're guaranteed to get the charges correct. How did I know this was not resonance? Well, resonance is when you're only moving pi electrons around within a single molecule. But here, we have two separate molecules interacting with each other, so it's definitely not resonance. It's an actual reaction. But in terms of the electron pushing arrows, the arrows work pretty much the same for mechanisms and for resonance. So we're learning about how to do both of those right now. Um, a lot of students make this into too much work. A lot of students try to figure out the charges by figuring out the formal charge from scratch. You know that in uh, general chemistry, you learned how to figure out the formal charge of any atom by counting up how many electrons are around it. And a lot of students think that they have to do that on every problem. Um, so it's hard to blame them that they get lazy and they don't put in the charges. So the important thing to see here is how much time we can save by using the electron pushing arrows. You never have to figure out the formal charges from scratch. If you're given the original formal charges, the arrows will always tell you what the new charge will be without having to calculate it again from scratch. And that saves us a lot of time. Um, where are these electrons actually coming from? Where is the iodine getting the electrons from that it's donating? 
they're coming from a lone pair. So you're expected to realize that when the tail of an arrow is on a negative charge, that really stands for a lone pair. In organic chemistry, we usually don't draw lone pairs. If you're taking the electrons from a lone pair, we oftentimes just draw them, uh, put the tail on the negative charge, where they're coming from. Um, where are the electrons going to? Well, these electrons are going into the sigma bond. Where are these electrons coming from? And where are they going to? To a lone pair. Yeah, but notice that I didn't draw that lone pair. Again, in organic chemistry, we usually don't draw the lone pairs. But anybody could tell that this has a new lone pair because it's got a negative charge. 